So uh, last time I tried to convince you that given the fundamental problems that the field faced in the uh, previous decade or two, it was clear we needed a machine that could probe the TEV scale, that an E plus and minus machine was clearly not the way to go, and that therefore we needed something involving protons and protons, or perhaps protons and antiprotons. And we needed a collider, which needed to sit in a circular ring. We had a ring available, a ring that was already existing at uh, CERN, where there had already been an E plus E minus machine of considerably lower energy used to study C and to search for the Higgs up to 115 GeV, but we needed a machine that could search for the Higgs all the way up to a TeV, or if the Higgs boson didn't exist, could find other things instead. Now the problem is the proton is complicated, very complicated, and uh, it Essentially, a proton proton machine is a collider of quarks, antiquarks, and gluons in various combinations. And so, we're going to need to look at what such a machine actually does. And uh, the challenge is that uh, cross section for two protons to hit each other is essentially the geometric cross section of a proton, which is about 10 to the minus 25 centimeters squared, or about a tenth of a barn. And that puts the total cross-section up here. The inelastic cross-section just being about half of that. And the problem is that everything interesting we want to make sits down many orders of magnitude below. So I want to start uh, by looking at that in a little bit more detail. So uh, let me remind you of a couple of definitions. So the luminosity of a collector is basically the thing that you multiply the cross-section by to get a number of events per second. And the number of events total, obviously, is just the integral. This is called the integrated luminosity times the cross-section. So what are the units of integrated luminosity? Well, cross-section comes in units of femtobarns. So this comes in units of per femtobarn, or in other words, femtobarn inverse. So, for um, example, uh, let's see, the total cross-section is about a tenth of a barn, and uh, the integrated luminosity I've drawn here is a function of year. Here's the, the center mass energy of the proton-proton collision. So in 2010 and 2011, collisions were at 7 TeV, and in 2011 there were 5 inverse couple of arms. 2012, the energy was increased to 8 TeV, and there were about 20. That's per experiment, so 20 at Atlas, 20 at CMS. LHCB has its own special issues, and Atlas also, so I won't talk about that. But for Atlas and CMS, these are the numbers. We're all thinking in 2015, we'll get comparable, maybe a little bit less luminosity, but at higher energy, maybe 12 TeV. Gradually increasing towards 13, maybe they'll even get it up to 14 someday, uh, and pushing luminosity. Uh, luminosity is already pretty high. It's not going to get that much higher unless they do some special things, which they may do in the next decade. So that's sort of where we are. Well, so let's just talk about 2012. Um, 20 inverse femtoworms. So, this is 10 to the 14 femtoborns. It's pretty impressive, right? <coughs> Last year, 10 to 15 or so collisions. Big number. So, um, so as I mentioned, I'm not sure how easy this is to see, so let me blow it up just a little bit. So, production of W bosons is about 10 to the minus 6 of the total cross-section, and to get a lepton out of that, you need another factor of 10. 
So, um, <clears throat> that's still a pretty impressive number of W's. 10 to the 8. 10 to the 8 W's became the left. Um, I remember back when every W was precious. In fact, it was only, it was only 1983 that they found this thing. Right? One W at a time. Now we make, now we're swimming in. Now there are backgrounds to everything. Making Z's is another factor of 10. Making Z's that decay to leptons is another factor of 10 down. Making top quarks a little bit, um, another factor of a few. These numbers, by the way, are for 14 TeV. The numbers for 7 and 8 TeV, these tend to go down by a factor of 3 or 4, but in a log plot, it's not that big a difference. So let me not worry about that distinction. Now let's go down. So there's the W. <clears throat> Here's a Higgs boson being produced and decaying to photons. Another factor of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6 below the W production pressure, below the W production rate. 10 to the minus 12 of the total rate gives you Higgs boson going to two photons. This makes it pretty clear why we need this many collisions. We're not going to be able to discover the Higgs with one gamma gamma effect. Not only that, maybe the Higgs isn't the standard model Higgs, and the rate for gamma gamma is down by a factor of 10 or worse. So we really better have enough of these. Here's the actual production rate for the Higgs. Notice um, the rate to go to photons depends on the Higgs mass. So let's just focus on this. This is the number of Higgs that you're actually producing. That's about a factor of, well, it's, it's, it's about a factor of 10 to the 3 below the W. And then you pay the price that Higgs bosons don't go to photons very often. Um, now you can ask, well, why are we looking for the Higgs to go to photons when the rate to go to photons is so small compared to the total rate of production? What does the Higgs normally decay to? What's its most common decay if you're up here? At the low mass. Bottom line. We'll go through that. It decays the bottom quarks because if it's light, it can't decay to W's and Z's because it's too light. It has mass less than twice the mass of W. It can decay to W plus an offshell W, or Z plus an offshell Z, you can pay a price for because one of them is offshell. So the thing that's going to decay to is the heaviest particle that's available, which it couples to, which is the bottom quark. So why don't we just produce the Higgs and look for the Higgs going up to the bottom quarks? Well, that has something to do with this. <laughs> Seven orders of magnitude. You're not going to find it. You're, in fact, this is a little bit of an overstatement. Let's see if I get it right. This is a little bit of an overstatement because these bottom parts produced in rest. And the Higgs boson produces bottom parts that have some energy. So, strictly speaking, maybe it's, maybe it's only five orders of magnitude. It doesn't matter. You are not going to find the Higgs boson decay to bottom parts by just looking for it. There actually is a trick for finding it, I'll tell you about that later, but you're not going to discover the Higgs that way. So, the reason we're looking for the Higgs going photons all the way down here is because we have huge backgrounds for bottom parts. In fact, huge backgrounds for anything that involves quarks and gluons. If you want to find something easily, what you're hoping is that it decays to something, or well, either it looks bizarre on its own, or it decays to something which is not purely quarks and gluons. You're looking for things like leptons and photons, because the rate to produce leptons is relatively small compared to the total process, which is still pretty big, but it's relatively small. Whereas if you're trying to look for something that goes to the quarks, you have gigantic backgrounds that you have to find. And this plot tells you all of it. That's why this graph is the first thing you need to look at and think about when you understand how these machines work. Any questions? We'll come back to this graph again in a few minutes. Okay. Um, I want to talk about a couple more things that are consequences of these numbers. Um, 
This is the number of collisions. There's about one megabyte of storage per collision to keep track of everything that happened in the event for any given experiment. 10 to the 15 megabytes is a lot of storage. And it's a lot of processing. It's too much. Can't handle it. So we produce all these collisions, but they can't store them. They can't analyze them. You have to throw most of them away. 99.9999% of the events are just thrown away. Never used. It's never seen. Nobody looks at them, they're gone. They're looked at just long enough to determine that, well, at least as far as a computer can tell, in a tiny fraction of a second, they look boring. This is called the trigger system. The trigger system is an automated system that looks at every event. Generally, it looks at a very limited piece of the event and determines this looks boring and throws it out. And if it doesn't think so, then it sends it into the next level of the trigger, which looks at the event in a little bit more detail, it can take more of the information. It looks at it in, um, it takes a little bit longer, and it decides, you know, that's still boring, and it throws it out. And it sends us a limited fraction of those up to the final level, which looks at the full event and determines whether it's boring or not. And the only reason that's possible is because of this huge factor between what you're producing and what's potentially interesting to you. But clearly, there are a lot of risks in this process. If you don't know what new physics looks like, isn't it possible you might just throw it away? And the answer is yes. So one of the jobs of theoretical physicists in this business is to think very creatively about all the crazy things that could possibly happen that are reasonable. What are all of the types of physics that could be thrown at us by nature? And make sure that the trigger pathways, of which there are many, are set up in such a way that we'll catch it one way or another, and we won't inevitably throw it out. If we are biased, if we are too limited in the way we think about new physics, then the LHC could miss the new physics, and it's powerful. Now, of course, experimenters are smart, so are theorists. There are various ways to, that are, to make the trigger fairly robust, so that there are lots of different ways that you can catch the new physics. It's unlikely you'll miss it entirely, but it could still make a difference if you're throwing 90% of the way versus when you're throwing 50% of the way. It could make a difference between discovering it soon versus maybe not discovering it for a long time which could make a difference in terms of whether governments fund the next machine in the future. It's important to make discoveries when you can make them, and not just wait 10 years until your backup trigger finally finds them. So, the trigger is an absolute requirement. We can't make enough things without having this many collisions. We can't store this many events. We must select one out of about a million events and therefore we have to have an automated system, and therefore we better think about it very carefully. Absolutely required. In an E plus E minus machine, this is not a problem. You just take every event. Proton, proton machines, this is a requirement. Okay, another problem. After you trigger, how many events have you stored? Well, you've stored about 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 events. So how are you going to find the new physics? Well, let's see, how many graduate students do we have? How many, how many events do you think each of you could look through it in, in, in a year? Just to check and see if anything ever seems to go on. It's not, it's not going to happen that way, right? <laughs> we don't have 10 to 6 graduate students. Um, so we need an automated system. All of the analysis is going to be automated. Controlled by human beings, we decide what analysis we want to do. But it's a huge amount of data. And one of the things that happens when you have a huge amount of data is that if there's something interesting in it, and that something is rare, as almost certainly it's going to be, here's production of supersymmetric particles. It's several orders of magnitude below the W. It's a rare event. You've got a huge amount of data, you've got a few events in there. If you don't ask the right question, you're not going to find them. They don't come with a big flag saying, hi, I'm new physics. So, job of theorists, as well as experimentalists, is to figure out what is a strategy 
which will allow you to find this type of new physics, or that type of new physics, or this type of new physics. Well, how many strategies do you need? Well, there's an enormous number of different types of new phenomena that might be in that data. So you better have a robust strategy for looking through that data, or again, you may have new discoveries sitting in the data and you're not looking for them. Is it possible that there is a no prize winning discovery waiting to be made in the data that has been collected so far and nobody's found it? Absolutely. Absolutely. There are many searches that have not been done in this data, and there are some that could be done and could uncover something remarkable in the data that we have. So when someone tells you, ah, the LHC hasn't found anything yet, you don't know that. You just know no humans found it. Very important. Again, if we're biased, if we don't suggest something interesting for them to look at, or we can't convince them to look for something interesting, and they don't look for it, Discovery just sits there waiting for years, and nobody makes it. There's plenty of examples in, in history of experiments that had discovery sitting in them and nobody looked at the right question. There's even an example of a discovery of a new resonance in E plus E minus that was sitting in an overflow bin. Nobody made the plot. Lots of examples. Crazy stuff. Make sure that you're thinking broadly. Make sure the experimental colleagues you talk to are thinking broadly. Don't forget to make plots of things that there shouldn't be anything interesting there. Maybe there is. Okay. So we have an important role to play as theorists at these experiments. We have to be creative both for the trigger and for the analysis. Um, now there's another important element of these big numbers which is that everything that can possibly go wrong will go wrong, sometimes. Now that's not a big deal if it goes, you know, one in a million, if you only have 100,000 events. But if you have 10 to the 15, you've got to worry about things that happen one in 10 to the 12. There are all sorts of, you know, you're looking for electrons. Sometimes some pie and hit something and scatters in such a way that it, it looks like an electron. Sometimes an electron, the track is sort of affected by some weird electronics and something looks like a photon. It happens all the time? No, not very often, but times 10 to 15, and suddenly it's a significant effect. Looking at these experiments is not merely a matter of looking for things that theorists can calculate. It also involves measuring very carefully fake rates. What is the probability that a jet looks like a photon. What is the probability that the photon looks like a photon? And so forth. Experiments have to do that. If you're naive about it, as theorists, you'll go calculate something. You'll think, oh, there's no big background. This, this is really easy. And then they'll say to you, did you forget about the fact that we have a fake rate of 10 to the minus 4, and that's big enough that it's 10 times as big as your signal? So as theorists, you have to understand the fake rates of the experiments you're doing. You can't calculate them. You can't measure them. I mean, you, can't, you have to assume that their measurements are right. But you have to know about them. Otherwise, you'll end up calculating things that are just simple. Um, I won't cover that sort of stuff in any great detail, although we'll run into it a few times as we look through some of the experiments. But you have to know that's there, and when you read an experimental paper, you got to read about those things. You've got to prepare it. You should expect them. All right, so, um, and then there's one more problem. <laughs> which is that, uh, as, as uh, so Professor Katani will be telling you how to do calculations, and um, one of the things that you'll learn is theorists can barely calculate anything at the LHC. How do you calculate this rate? Oh, you just do a Feynman diagram and here's the answer. Well, no, you have to take the Feynman diagram and you have to combine it with the part distribution functions. Okay, that's not such a big deal, um, but you better put in the one-loop correction, because the one-loop corrections to calculations involving QCD processes are big, because alpha s is 10. And also there are logs. Alpha s times log is maybe 30%. Oh, and it's even worse than that. Because when you calculate a process in QCD, the answer is proportional to alpha s to some power. Alpha s evaluated at what scale? 
perturbation theory doesn't tell you that in leading order. If you do a tree level calculation, it's just alpha s to some power. You don't know which alpha s to put in. You put in different alpha s's, you may get answers that differ by a factor of two, easily. So, how do you work? How do you fix that? We go to the next order. You calculate the next order in alpha s, and now the dependence on what choice you made for alpha s starts to cancel. Professor Catani will explain that later. So you get less and less dependence on which alpha s you chose. The dependence on the normalization scale should get less and less and less the more orders you calculate. Because if you calculate the infinite order, the answer doesn't depend on the normalization scale, which is an arbitrary choice on your part. And leading order depends enormously. At very high order, it doesn't depend much. So you have to calculate at least to the next order. Well, until very recently, that, those calculations were virtually impossible, except in the simplest cases. Only in the last few years has there been a revolution in the calculational techniques that we have available, so that we can now start to calculate a significant number of one-loop graphs to complicated processes. Okay, the W has been done. The W plus three jets wasn't done until very recently. The W plus four jets was considered impossible until it was done. Very, very recently. So, but you're not done. That's calculating the differential cross-section for a process. Now you have to calculate what they measure. Well, what they measure is what you calculate, because the detector has a weird shape. It can measure things that go off at certain angles. It can measure things down at certain energy. Well, you have to now do complicated intervals, which you're not going to do analytically, to account for the shape of the detector. So in the end, you do that with a simulation package. So you as theorists can calculate the basic ingredients, but then there's a lot of processing that has to go through before you can connect what you calculate to what they measure. So, um, and conversely, what the experimenters find easy to measure is often impossible for us to calculate because there's big QCD corrections. So we're working all the time to try to convince them, no, 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 please measure this. I know it's harder because at least we can calculate it. And that communication between experimental and theorists is always a problem because they want to measure something that's easy for them experimentally. We want them to calculate, we want them to measure something that we can actually match to calculation with small error bars. And there's a mismatch, inevitably. All right, so um, the part of the part of the consequence of this is the experimenters don't really trust theorists to get all this stuff right, so they always check it in the data. When they do comparisons of data with prediction, they're always checking the prediction itself in the data in various ways. So data is always really being compared with data in the end, with some input from experiment, or some input from theory. But it's not like we take a theoretical calculation, we make a plot, and we see if the data just simply agrees with that. Usually in searching for new physics, you want something that checks the data against the data, because supposing the data and the prediction don't, the theory prediction don't agree, does that mean you've made a new discovery? Or does that mean there's some subtlety in the way theory gets converted to experiment, or some way that the, extent the theorist did the calculation, which isn't quite accurate? So then you get into a big debate, have you made a discovery, or the theorist just screwed up? Well, if the experimental screwed up using the theory. And there have been various false discoveries announced in the press, you probably heard about them in just the last three years. That happens all the time. The LHC people are very, very careful now. But uh, there was an experiment at the, uh, there was a measurement at the CDF experiment at uh, the Tevatron claimed to have found a new particle in the case of the two jets. And the experts said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we looked at the plots and we knew about the theoretical calculation, we knew how they were using them, and we said, not very, not very likely. Probably just a problem with how they're using theory, and that was in fact the case. So none of this is easy. None of this is easy, and all of it requires expertise of various different sorts, and that's why this, these machines are challenges for theorists. Uh, if anything would make, I mean, it's, it, you know, how many people here are studying string theory? Nobody. Okay, so self-selecting. Right. Um, I mean, I have to say, it's sort of a shame. Where are the string theorists? They have to learn this too. Um, I do string theory. Why not? Um, you should learn some string theory, and you'll see why in these lectures. Um, it's important for understanding QCD, for example. But anyway, um, that's an aside. Um, if, you, if you think that theorists do calculations and the experiments just go measure things, you're not thinking about how these machines actually work. And in a pattern collider, the experimenters measure the thing and the theorists hope to calculate something. We are not in the driver's seat. 
in this type of machine. And that, therefore, we have to really understand what the experiment is doing. Okay. Um, any questions? <coughs> yes. So when talking about the next generation of colliders, I don't see any decreases to another thing. So, um, in the next generation of colliders, what's the reason to do uh, an, uh, another hacker collider? This is a great question. Why don't we save this for a discussion in the, in the question time? That is to say, what, what should we do next? Well, I mean, what I'll be telling you in the lectures will reflect that, but, but it, it, is a, it is a serious question. It deserves some discussion, but it is a little bit off topic, so let me, let's come back to it. What are the requirements of the first trigger? What are the requirements of the first trigger? Let me come back to that in just a few minutes. Um, it's actually a very complicated story, and so I certainly won't describe it in detail, but I will come back to it um, uh, maybe in 15, 15, 20 minutes. <coughs> actually, maybe a little bit. Actually, in that, is the time triggers uh, synchronized with the frequency of the the trigger is designed so that as every collision comes in, the, a certain portion of the detector is read out and shipped into the trigger system. So everything is absolutely timed to the NASA. <coughs> yeah, it all has to be. That, that's part of what experiments have to do. They have to make sure this giant detector with all the things that come in and out are timed to the NASA. Fun stuff. Okay, we need to spend a little bit of time, it's boring, but we have to do it, on uh, kinematics just to make sure we have our definition straight. Um, I apologize for those of you who know this already, but yeah, it doesn't take too long. Um, so, here's a proton-proton collision. The protons are coming in along this axis, the z-axis. And let's look at a particle that comes out at an angle theta from the beam pipe. Now, there's a quantity called eta, which is used in these experiments, instead of theta. Eta is called the pseudo-rapidity, not to be confused with the rapidity, the relation between them become clear in a moment. The pseudo-rapidity is just a rewriting of the angle. Right, maybe the easiest way to remember it is that the, the hyperbolic tangent of eta is the cosine of theta. And that is the effect that when theta is near pi over 2, eta and theta are just linearly related. So, for very small angles perpendicular to the beam pipe, uh, sorry, for when you're almost perpendicular to the beam pipe, a change in eta is almost a change, a change in theta. But, at uh, very small angles, or angles very close to pi, eta is growing logarithmically. So, the beam pipes are at equals plus and minus infinity. Now, why do we use this variable? Well, it has to do with its relation with the variable called rapidity that Katani mentioned already in an earlier lecture. So let's look at a particle that's coming out. It has some energy and has some momentum. The rapidity, now this is not related to angle. Now this is a quantity which is, well, sort of a useful quantity in relativistic kinematics. Right? It's one half the log of E plus PZ and E minus PZ. So this is sort of rapidity along this axis. If you prefer, it's the inverse tangent of the velocity of the particle, the component velocity of the particle along the beam pipe, which is just PZ over here. Now, this, uh, this quantity has a very special property, which is why it's interesting in relativistic kinematics, which is that if I do a boost along this axis, um, let's get it right. So if I boost, by a velocity beta, then y goes to y plus um, tangent tangent inverse. Sorry, let's do this way. Y goes to y plus the inverse hyperbolic tangent of beta. In other words, under boost along the z-axis, the z the rapidity in the z direction adds uh, it shifts linearly. Or another way to say it is if I have two particles that in this frame have, have y1 and y2, the difference of the rapidities, delta y, is boost invariant. 
<coughs> and this is true for all particles, I'm boosting everything, I'm boosting the frame, not the partial. So changes in rapidity are the right All right, so that's why we like rapidity. Why do we like pseudo rapidity? Because you should prove this for a massless particle. Y and beta are the same. Hence the name pseudo rapidity. It's not true for massive particles. It's not true for massive collections of particles. That is to say, a pair or a triple of particles that has an invariant mass. So be careful, remember that. But for a single massless or effectively massless particle, and most of the particles we observe in the detectors have masses much less than momenta, so most of them are satisfying this condition, these are equal. Please prove that at It's important. Okay. Now, because of this, supposing I have two particles, and I want to tell you how far apart they are in angle. Well, um, normally, if you were just doing spherical coordinates, you would tell me there's, a, there's an angle phi around the beam pipe. So you would tell me what's the difference in phi and what's the difference in theta. That would give you a, a natural distance measure on a sphere. Maybe with some cosine theta go thrown in. But here, we really want something that's more cylindrical and takes advantage of the fact that eta for massless particles is Lorentz invariant. Not eta, sorry, delta. So the distance between two particles that's Lorentz invariant, if they're massless, involves a z-boost. And I want to be able to talk about things in the Lorentz invariant way, relative at least to z-boosts. And that's why this variable is very convenient, because this quantity is the same in the part by part frame as in the left frame. Okay. Let's do a little bit of parton kinematics. Remember that anything I calculate involving partons I write with a hat over the variable. So, now in these machines, we're almost always, well, not always, but usually, um, commonly, we're going to be working, and certainly for anything in the initial state, we're going to be working with particles whose mass is much less than their energy, in other words, they are effectively massless. Um, and uh, certainly that's true in, in the initial state. So the, the, the total energy. Um, which we'll call, well, so the total parton energy in the parton parton collision is what we'll call square root of s hat. And s hat is just the uh, square of k1 squared plus k2 squared, which is about 2k1 
dot k2. But uh, k1 is x1 times the proton's momentum, and k2 is x2 times the other proton's momentum. So this is approximately x1, x2, p1 dot p2, sorry, p2, which is approximately um, x1, x2, p1 plus p2 squared, which is equal to x1, x2, s. Partronic center mass energy is x1 is the, well, <coughs> the center mass energy for partons, PCM, is the square root of x1, x2, um, the center mass energy to the left of the protons. some of the obvious variables in the lab frame of a partonic collision. So let's say we have um, Zero. But in the lab frame, E and P are not so. And um, the energy is just x1 plus x2 times EB, since that's how much energy this parton has plus how much energy that parton has. And the z momentum is just x1 minus x2. In other words, if the x's are equal in the lab, then if the x's are equal, then the partons are head on with equal and opposite momenta, and otherwise the frame is moving, and that's how much momentum they have. Um, the momentum transverse to the beam is obviously zero. The velocity is just the ratio of the momentum to the energy. And the rapidity of the partonic system, this is important. Is log of x1 over x2. That this follows from this formula using these two formulas. So really this is where I was going. This is the rapidity of the parton-parton frame relative to the left. And just for fun, I'll write one more formula because it's cute. Okay. Now, the important thing about these formulas is that you can now, if, for example, you, you manage to measure these quantities, for example, suppose you have two partons, they collide, and, and they produce a particle which then decays in some way, and you can measure everything. For example, you make a z-boson, the z-boson decays to two muons. Now you know the frame of the partons in the initial state because you measure the particles in the final state. Well, you can work backwards by, from knowing the frame to figure out what x1 and x2 were. Okay? What's the formula? x1 
is equal to the square root of s hat over s e to the y hat. And x2 is the same thing with an e to the minus y hat. So the whole point of this exercise was to convince you that if I measure the final state completely, I actually know something about the initial state. I know what x1 and x2 were for part months that were coming. Let's just say I have two to two scattering, two particles in, two particles out, k1, k2, going to k3, k4. So I run the formula for s hat, it's also equal, of course, by the momentum conservation to k3 plus k4 squared. And the quantities t hat and u hat, which are the mental step variables, I assume that you've all seen. Um, which, I mean, which Thing you call t hat, what you call u hat, is often ambiguous, but um, once you make the choice, then here's the definitions. Again, each equation is related to the other one by momentum conservation, and a fact that you should check if you've never checked it before is that s hat plus t hat plus u hat is actually equal to m1 squared plus m2 squared plus m3 squared plus m4 squared. So in particular, if all the particles are massless, there's a simple relation between st and u. <clears throat> I suppose they're okay, so. Say again? They're all okay, so. Yes, I'm sorry. I've got k's, I've got p's in my notes, and k's on the on the board. That's what happens when you change notation when you're teaching. It always causes problems. Okay, so um, now in the center mass frame of the particles. <clears throat> So that's t hat, and u hat is the same thing with plus sign. And you can check, of course, that indeed s hat plus t hat plus u hat is zero, and I'm assuming all the particles are massless in this expression. Um, so I invite you, to, you should double check that. Um, now, what this means is that if I look at the transverse momentum of particle number four, or three, particle three, The transverse momentum, that's momentum transverse to the beam pipe, which is the energy of the particle, which is just the center mass energy divided by two, all the particles carrying average energy, times, sorry, the sine of the angle, right? If it's moving exactly perpendicular to the beam pipe, then the transverse momentum is the momentum. It's moving along the beam pipe, there's no transfer from the And you can write this, just having some fun with these formulas, as t hat u hat over 2s hat. Which confirms something you already knew, but it's nice to see it. That the transverse momentum of the particle is a nice variable to pay attention to. 
because it's the same in the parking center mass frame and in the lab frame. Whereas obviously the momentum along the B pipe is not. So, here's another quantity. The transverse momentum of a particle is another boosted variant quantity. We're going to therefore try and make measurements in terms of those quantities. Okay. So, um, to summarize, so far, we have noted a few quantities which are boost invariant and therefore especially nice for experimenters to measure if the theorists to calculate in terms of the transverse momentum of particles delta r or more generally delta eta phi itself is the Lorentz invariant so obviously delta phi is angle around the B-pipe, that doesn't change, we boost. And of course, anything that I can measure that's, li that's literally an invariant, that I can construct out of the final state particles, or initial state particles. So these are all Z-boost invariant. You will never see measurements of quantities in other things. Um, any questions? Let me just mention two or three quantities that you will come across in measurements that involve combinations of these things. Um, one of them is sort of a measure of how much stuff is going perpendicular to the beam pipe. When you have collision stuff goes flying out right So roughly speaking, how much? And you might think that you don't need to know that. You might think the only thing you care about is you know, the center mass energy of the collision. So just measure the invariant mass of everything that goes out. But as we discussed, there can be things that go down the beam pipe and you lose them. So studying the some measure of how much stuff goes sideways is a pretty good measure of how, how energetic the partonic collision was. It's not perfect, but it gives you a rough idea. And there's a quantity which Sometimes it's called HT, sometimes it's called ST, sometimes it's called M effective, some sort of effective mass. It's called all sorts of different things. You have to look at the definitions when you're reading experimental papers. But the thing which is often called HT or M effective is the sum, maybe over everything you measure, that has a lot of energy. So all of the high energy electrons and muons and photons and jets from quarks and muons. Ignoring the particles that are sort of stray low momentum particles. You take the transverse momentum of these various things, you add them up, you add them as, <coughs> you add them as a scalar. Of course, the transverse momentum is a vector, point center, perpendicular to the beam pipe. You just take the absolute value of it and you just sum them up. So it's, it's not the sort of quantity you would think about in relativistic kinematics, but it is a useful quantity in these machines. So in particular what that means is if I have a collision and two particles go out back to back, this is twice their transverse momentum. Um, an equally important quantity is the missing transverse momentum. Remember, transverse momentum, unlike momentum along the z-axis or energy, is conserved in these machines in terms of what you actually measure. And that is as a sum vectorially the transverse momentum. So now if I have two particles back to back, there'll be HT, but no missing PT. 
And then people define something called, or what they should call is the missing transverse momentum, but for various experimental reasons they usually call it the missing transverse energy, or MET. And this is the absolute value of the missing transverse momentum. Which, you notice, is actually the absolute value of the vectorial sum of all the things you do measure. Right? It's not a measure of the momentum of the thing you didn't measure. Because there might be several things you didn't measure, and they may add and partially cancel. It's a measure of what you saw, not what you didn't see. It's a measure of what you saw didn't balance in momentum. That's important, because if I have two protons collide, they make two particles of dark matter. So basically, most things go along the B-pipe, but two parts of the dark matter go flying out. There's lots of missing energy if we knew how to measure that energy, but we can't, because we can't measure what goes down the B-pipe. So we don't know we made those two particles because we don't observe anything going transverse to the B-pipe. There's no HT, and there's no missing transverse momentum. In fact, we won't trip around this event at all. Because it just looks like a boring event. Nothing happened. How do we detect dark matter? Well, that's, we'll get to it, I suppose. Okay? Um, any questions about these things? Now we're going to go to something interesting. First, any basic issues? QC stands for quantum chromodynamics, and they're almost equal. Everything at the LHC involves QCD, right? Proton proton collisions means in every event there's QCD somewhere. So you better understand QCD. Part of that is understanding Katani's lectures about perturbative QCD. But there are a lot of non perturbative, semi perturbative things that are going on. And also, I think it's important as theorists for you to appreciate that QCD as we see it in nature is not like all similar theories. If I give you a theory with some number of colors, n, c, and some number of flavors, n, f, it doesn't necessarily do what we observe at our, at our, in our experiments. So QCD is an example where the number of colors is three, while the number of flavors is six, but really the number of flavors is not What's really the point, more than anything else, is, as it turns out, the number of light flavors, that is to say, the number of flavors with mass less than or more of a QCD scale, and that's three, up, down, and straight. All right, so there's some facts about QCD that I want to make sure you know um, and that you understand. Um, first thing is, uh, In the ultraviolet, it's free, in the sense that the coupling, I mean, it's not that free, it's coupling very, very slowly to zero. It's not zero, the Planck scale, it's still pretty significant. But it's becoming weaker. And in the infrared, right, I'm going to write the word confining here, but as we discussed yesterday, we've got to be a little careful with that word, so I'll put it in quotes. What this really means, experimentally, no one can prove this to you. Somebody in this room maybe can someday, but no one has. What this means experimentally is that you never see a quark on its own. So maybe a better word is the quarks are cloaked. They're not stuck inside, inside a given proton, but they're always stuck inside some atom. <laughs> so so they're, they're always, they're always, but I'll call it confining here, but remember that it's in quotes. Now this is true for this theory. But it's not true in general. Um, so, in fact, you already heard us a little bit about this in, in Professor Sundram's lectures. So in QCD, 
If you look at how alpha s varies this function of scale, there's some confinement scale, some strong coupling scale more accurately, and the coupling kind of does this. It's a log plot. If NF were 17, what would happen? Is it more like QED? It's more like QED, that's right. The beta function is proportional to this quantity, the default important line of sign. If NF is large enough, the sign flips, and it's more like QED, where the coupling would actually have a Landau pole. So that theory wouldn't have this property. What about if NF light is equal to 10? Well, you can't see anything different from the one loop formula with this two loop formula. And the two loop formula isn't, strictly speaking, something where you can prove this, because what I'm about to say is not really visible in perturbation theory, but there are indications from last calculations that your guess of the following form would be correct. But the coupling actually does this. It goes to a fixed point. So it's ultraviolet free, but it doesn't have confinement. It's scale invariant in the infrared. There's no hat drums. Um, now that's all that can happen if you start at weak coupling, but you don't have to start at weak coupling. You can have theories that are confining, but at high energies they go to a fixed point. You can have theories that start at one fixed point, we go to another fixed point. All of these are possible. QCD has these properties. It's not generic that field theories have this property. All right, another property that QCD has is that I can write differential cross sections as I discussed last time in a sort of factorized form. Now, there's all sorts of subtleties with this, and Professor Katani will explain some of them. But I can write cross sections in terms of the probability for finding parton 1 inside the proton at a particular x, and similarly for parton 2, times a process that I can calculate in perturbation theory involving 1 plus 2 goes to something else. That's factorization of, well, it's the first hint of factorization property of fun. And in particular, this is perturbative. And this is not. Okay, this is not perturbative, but it's measurable because it's process independent. If the part of distribution functions I need to use in proton proton collisions were different from the ones I had to use in proton electron collisions, or the ones I used in proton proton dose and Higgs it were different from the ones I used in proton proton dose at TT bar, I'd have a problem. It's very special that these non perturbative things I cannot calculate. I can measure because they're process independent. And then the process itself I can calculate the perturbation theory if it's a process with sufficiently high energy and momentum transfer. Again, this is not obvious. This is a property of living on this theory. For some of these other theories, we might not have hadrons at all, and obviously this is the wrong calculation. For other theories, we never go to weak coupling, and even in the ultraviolet. Perturbation theory never works. So don't take this for granted. Again, it's a property of this theory. It's not a property of all such theories. Now, before I tell you about other properties of this theory, let's talk a little bit about these all-important part-time distribution functions. There'll be more of this in Professor Katani's lectures, of course, but we need it, and he has got to. So, um,
Okay. Here are the partner distribution functions. Now, partner distribution functions, strictly speaking, are a function of scale. They're not really physical things, but they don't change very much for scale any more than alpha s does uh, in the perturbative regime. So this is a measure of what the partner distribution, fu distribution functions look like at some particular scale, and they don't change that much. The important thing to notice is this is x on a log scale, and this is a, well, how you normalize these things is something you have to think about, but let's not worry about the normalization. What this is telling you, again, these are telling you the probability, in this case, we simple relative probability, to find a parton of a particular type with a particular fraction of the, of the proton's momentum. So obviously, nothing, you can't find anything with the total momentum of the proton. The probability of finding something with half the momentum of the proton, basically the only thing you have are up and down quarks. And not surprisingly, the up quark probability is bigger than the down quark probability, because there are, roughly speaking, two valence quarks in a proton, as opposed to one down quark. So that's why you use big D. Notice that it isn't exactly twice, right? It is not the case that u is twice d, u, that u of x is not twice d of x. Sorry, let me be clear. u of x is what I'm calling f u of x. Um, in this plot, that just means the probability of finding the up quark in phi inside of her. So indeed, at high x, you're more likely to find quarks than anything else, more likely to find up quarks than down quarks. But already by the time you get to one tenth of the gluons of the proton's momentum, and remember, let's see, we're working with the LHC. This past year, the LHC was running at 8 TeV. That means the beams of protons were at 4 TeV. So if you're looking for a particle of 400 GeV, it's more likely to be a gluon than anything else. And then that probability just gets bigger. Gluons dominate the proton for you know, below 800 GeV collisions at an 8 TeV collision. The Higgs, of course, is 125 GeV. So you need particles of energy around 60 GeV, which is down here. Lots of gluons. Not so many quarks. What about antiquarks? Remember, those are also being created. You know they have to be. Quarks can radiate gluons, and gluons can split into quark antiquark pairs, and it's certainly going to be in there. Well, here they are. There are not very many of the high momentum, but as you get to lower and lower momentum, the probability of finding a quark and the probability of finding an antiquark are approaching each other. That's not surprising. Since most of the quarks and antiquarks here are, since, uh, sorry, since what, what this is telling you is that the valence quarks become a less and less significant contribution to the quarks. And more and more of these quarks are uh, being produced in pairs with these antiquarks. So with very low momentum, Q, Q bar, a Q is as likely as a Q bar, and high momentum of Q is much more likely than a Q bar. Such is the basic structure of the proton, and of course, um, it's not obvious. U bar and D bar are similar, but not exactly the same, and S bar is a little smaller, similar. Only by the time you get to char quarks do you start to get much smaller numbers. Okay, let's look at this in a little bit more detail in a different plot. Notice this is a log plot versus this is log versus log. Now I'm going to do something different. This allows you to see a little bit more detail. This is linear versus log, but this is not the Cartan distribution function. This is the Cartan distribution function times x squared. People will often make plots with an x squared or an x, so that you don't have these things flying off to infinity that makes it hard to read. So in a linear scale, here's the relationship between up quark, anti-up quark. And, and now you can see how the u and u bar approach each other here, and how the gluons take over there. But how at very high x, you're dominated by the Now, in a proton proton machine, that means that in high energy, your dominant collisions are quark quark, very high energy, but quark quark isn't useful for very much. Two quarks don't annihilate. If you want q q bar, the problem is there's no q bars around. You've got to go down. Um, you've got lots of blue blue collisions and blue quark collisions. Those are the things that are happening most often. Now this leads me to define a quantity which you're probably not familiar with, unless you've really been studying this stuff, which is called a parton, parton, or just simply parton, luminosity. This is actually the most important thing for understanding the implications of those parton functions. And the point is that we start with this formula, and we use some of the formulas that I've unfortunately just erased about chemax. Uh, 
So the part of the reason I had to go through all that kinematic stuff is because of the following important definition. The point is that the integral 0 to 1 of dx1 dx2 can be written as an integral using the, using the fact, which I guess I'll have to write again, that s hat is x1 x2 s and um, uh, e to the y is x1 over x2, the rapidity of the hat on that in the y. I wrote it as y hat, it was log of that, it's the same one. I think there's I think there's, I think there's a mistake. Um, yeah, well the student's name. No. No, it's right. Sorry, right. it's right. Worry about a factor of two. Let me just say. Square root. Well, that means I can change variables. Instead of integrating over x1 and x2, I can integrate over these variables. And I need it to check. Is um, square root of s hat over s e to the y hat f2 square root of s hat over s e to the minus y hat. But the important thing is what happens to this thing. Y hat is the boost of the parton parton system. d sigma hat doesn't care about that. d sigma hat is a function. Of s hat. It may be a function of t hat and u hat also. But y hat has nothing to do with those things. Y hat is the boost of that of the collision. And what happens in the collision, you have to calculate. But it doesn't care what the boost was. Q Q scattering is the same whether the Qs are this way, or colliding in this frame, or they're colliding in that frame. Same calculation. So we can factor this off, this part right here, as the only part which depends on um, the part of the distribution functions. And so we can write this as a parton luminosity for partons one of, of type 1 and type 2, and it only depends on S hat over S. Is that clear? Now that's just plotted here. What's plotted here, this is the partonic center of mass energy, which they've called capital M, same as square root of S hat. And here in the log plot is the relative probability for two gluons to collide with the center of mass energy M. And, and think about it, I mean, this, this, this makes a lot of sense. If you're trying to make a heat you don't care what frame you made it in, you care whether you made it. So you're not interested in F1 and F2 for two gluons. You're interested in convolving the two gluons together and asking what is the probability of a gluon from one proton hit another gluon from another proton at 125 GeV. That's what this plot gives you. That's what these parts of the monocytes are telling you. So this is a very useful quantity of you. And you can see that if you're down at a, I mean, this plot doesn't go down far enough. Just barely goes down far enough, I guess. If you're looking for Higgs bosons or anything like it, your most likely collisions are blue glue or part glue. And QQ bar is much smaller. In fact, QQ bar never catches up. 
it's always, you're always less likely to have a QQ bar with a center mass energy of M than glue glue. But quark glue becomes more and more important as you get the higher and higher energies. And if we drew quark quark, it would be a little higher. And uh, quark quark actually is important for reasons that will become clearer later, but only in special circumstances. <coughs> Questions about this? This is very important. This is, um, yeah. Questions? This is a very important concept. The other thing that you see, aside from the relative distributions, is that everything is falling like crazy as you go to higher energy. The probability of making gluons, uh, gluon gluon pairs that collide with an energy of 200 GB is many orders of magnitude larger than doing so at 1,000 GB. And what this means is that every plot you will ever see at the, at the Large Hadron Collider that involves anything that has to do with energy or momentum will fall like a rock. And that's going to be a challenge for making measurements. As well as for just looking at plots. We're going to see that. <clears throat> yeah? So, so this is a given energy? This is at a given proton proton energy. Here is data, very early data. No, sorry, not so early. This is recent. At ATV, the full, the full data set. This is the data for proton proton at CMS for proton proton to produce a muon and an anti muon somehow. A muon plus an anti muon plus anything else. And it's plotted as the invariant mass of the muon anti muon pair. What's that? That's the second. Z boson. Okay, we got the Z boson sitting around 90 GB. And then after that, it just drops. And it drops a lot. Look at the orders of magnitude. And the three is the best per GeV. And it drops down to a one, one one hundredth of an event per GeV. In other words, one, one event every 100 GeV, just so it's being seen here. Um, there are several things to observe on this plot, so let's stare at it carefully. First of all, there's the fact that the data falls very, very rapidly. That's just the part on the monosity. But to some extent, the cross-section is decreasing with energy. Just any cross-section for producing two new ones off shove would fall at one with the energy squared by dimensional analysis. But this is falling much faster than that, and that's because this is produced mostly in that quark, anti-quark part on the monosity, which falls very rapidly. Now you notice, so, so this is a log plot. There are three curves here. What are these three curves and how do we read them? This is trivial, but so easy to make a mistake the first time. So pay attention. When you read this plot, what you're looking at is this plus this plus this. And when you first look at this plot, it looks like this is big and this is small. But then you remember, wait a second, this is a log plot. Whatever this curve is, it's sitting at 10 here, and this curve is sitting close to 100. This is big, this is small, this is very small. The volumes, the areas of the curve do not reflect, you have to pay attention to that. If this were a linear plot, you'd read it completely differently. Log plot, when they stack the data like this, it's the guy on top that's big. No matter how small it looks. Right, relatively. Um, now, what do we see here? What we see here is that, indeed, producing an off-shell, a mu plus mu minus by an off-shell photon or Z is the biggest thing. That is the most common way to produce a mu one anti one pair at the LHC. The next most common, down by about a factor of 10 or so, is to produce them via some other method, like top quarks. Top quarks can make muons, so two top quarks can make a mu one plus and a mu one and an anti Top W, W W Z, Z Z, Tau Tau. All these different ways don't involve directly making a mu plus and mu minus, and instead the muons are made in the decay of something else. Well, those are not negligible if you want to make precision measurements, but they're relatively small. So that's what we're trying to do. You need to remember that there. What's this? Checks. Huh? 
Let's take that to do with you. Thanks. Are they fake? Well, they are in a sense. They are fake, isolated muons. But they're real muons. Where do they come from? Meson decays. Right? You make a jet. The jet has a bottom quark in it. Bottom quark meson, then decays to a char quark meson, plus a lepton and a neutrino. That lepton can be a, a muon. Now, most of the time, that muon is going to be surrounded by other particles in the decay of the B meson, and you're going to, your, your, your experimentalist will say, this is not an isolated muon. It's a muon inside of a jet. That's not really the muon I'm interested in. I'll throw that out. But there's a lot of jets. And every so often, you get an isolated muon. In fact, it's not rare at all. The only thing that's rare is the two of them. It's not rare because, well, it's a rare thing to happen, but there's a huge number of jets. Fortunately, if you demand two of them, you don't get it very often. So that's a relatively small effect for mu plus mu minus. If you're only looking for one muon, however, it can be a big effect. That's the context. So there's a lot of this stuff. I think that's a good Any other questions about it? Yeah? Um, how can they tell if they come from a jet or what? Excellent question. So how do they how do they make this how do they make this plot? Well what they usually do, especially so it depends on context how they do this, but in a case like this where they're looking for two of them, the clever thing is to look for a case where they have one of them. So they'll look for a situation where they have a jet on one side, and typically they'll check to see whether it's a bottom quark jet or a char quark jet, and we'll discuss how they do. Because those are the most common sources for muons. And then they'll look on the other side to see if they have an isolated muon. And the probability of getting an isolated muon is a little bit isolated, maybe they relax the isolation, isolation criteria a bit too to see how things are becoming more and more isolated. This looking at the probability that something is partially isolated or very isolated. In an event that already has a bottom quark and therefore probably had a second bottom quark. And if they understand the standard model well enough and understand the detector well enough, they'll get a probability that a single jet. Fix a muon. And then they have the problem with two jets do. There are other, there's another way they can do it just to look at, at and this you have to think about why this would work. They look at the possibility to get two muons at the same sign, as opposed to one on one side and one on the other side. Because that can happen too. The bottom part decays to a charm part, and the charm part gives you a muon of the other side you expect. So there are various tricks. But yeah, it's real work. And part of the cleverness of being an experimentalist at this collider is to answer questions just like yours. How are we going to figure that out? So if I can support you, need a trick. Okay, um, let's see. Do I have anything else to say about that? No. Okay, good. So let's come back to this plot. So. <clears throat> What dominates the cross section is glancing blows. Proton, proton goes to proton, proton is a significant part of the cross section. Right? These two come close together, they don't actually hit each other, they just bounce. Or they hit each other and they still bounce without doing anything. They can also hit each other and um, become excited protons. Delta resonance, for example, is one of the most common things. So you might have proton, proton goes to proton plus a delta, and then the delta decays to a proton and a pi, a neutron. Those are the common things that occur. You don't see those because everything just goes right down the deep in those cases. So they literally not work at all. Um, then eventually, come down a little bit, and you start getting proton, proton goes to proton plus a spray. Several happens. Enough that maybe a few of them have a little bit of transverse momentum, they actually enter the detector, they don't have a lot of momentum, so they probably spin around in the magnetic field, but they get detected. An event which has one such observed track, it's not literally everything, but it's most of, it's a significant fraction of the cross-section. Such an event is called a minimum bias event. Because if you select such an event, it's not literally zero bias, you just pick an event at random. But it's the minimum bias you can have. When you pick an event that has something to detect, in this case, just perhaps a single track. So minimum bias events, Here's a slightly more active one. Look like this. Okay? There's all sorts of. Uh, let's see if we can put the lights here. 
here's a, a randomly chosen event at Atlas, almost randomly. Um, all it's got is a bunch of tracks going off in different directions. Of course, most of the tracks are going off here. Why don't we see any tracks here? Why aren't there any tracks here? There is no track there. There's no tracker there. Right? The tracks go out as far as the tracker is, and then they stop. And you can tell by looking at how curved these tracks are <laughs> that they all have relatively low momentum. If you remember from yesterday, we had a, a, an electron that was almost a straight line, 40 GeV energy. These all have energy of a GeV or two, maybe even less. And there's probably a lot of tracks in here they haven't even drawn, which are just going around and around and around. <laughs> they know they're there. They can measure them, but they won't put them on the plot because they just clutter up the plot. This is a boring event, and it's most of the cross section. And then we come down and we start making jets. Okay. Most jets are from glue glue goes to glue glue to glue what scatter off each other. Maybe glue glue goes to T2 bar. And they can have very low energy, they can have very high energy. So actually trying to find just a pair of low energy jets that are hard to find. Here's a pair of high energy jets. This is what an event might look like. It's got a spray of particles going this way, it's got a spray of particles going in the opposite direction, in the transverse plane. It actually happens that this event is more or less back to back, even in the left frame, but that doesn't have to be the case. That is to say, you could have had this jet going this way, and the other jet goes that way, right? That doesn't have to balance. But that's the balance in the transverse plane. There's a little bit of other stuff coming out, and then of course there's all the stuff they didn't draw. If you look carefully, there's all sorts of activity in this detector, all these, all these gray lines are fragments of tracks that they didn't bother to plot. Very messy. And make it look pretty. You look at real data. It's full of electronic noise, and particles going flying everywhere, and parts of previous events. They're, they're, they're pretty good at what they do. They pick out the right ones most of the time. Every now and then they get a fake track. But, so what are we seeing here? So we're seeing tracks, we're seeing energy in the electromagnetic calorimeter, we're seeing energy in the hadronic calorimeter, and all of that is consistent with a jet. Because a jet should have hadrons in it. What types of hadrons? Well, some that don't decay and give you tracks and they're charged. Some that are neutral and go to the hadronic calorimeter. Some which decay to photons, which give you stuff from the magnetic calorimeter. This is a typical jet. Well, not so typical. This is a very high energy jet. But... And here's the other one. Okay. And then just softer energy, and there's a little bit of energy here and there. There's that's most of what happens that's even vaguely interesting the LHC, stuff like this. Two objects scattered, two objects, maybe three, maybe four. But they're just all quarks. Now, why do we see an event like this? What's in it? What is in those jets? So this is the non-projective part of QCD. You don't have to know a lot about it, but you need to know a few things. And really, as a part of the physicist, you ought to know. Here are the hadrons listed by uh, mass. I haven't chosen all of them. As you get up here, there's more and more and more of them. But here are some of the most important ones. I've listed their flavor quantum numbers in terms of up, down, and strange quarks. Here there are a couple of charm and a couple of bottom mesons. I've listed what they decay to, and I've listed their lifetimes. And I've coded the lifetime by color. Here's a set which have lifetimes of the order of 10 to the minus 23, 10 to the minus 24 seconds. What time scale is that? Why do we see a bunch of things? Why are the shortest of the things here having time scales of that sort? Can't hear you. They decay stronger. They decay by the strong interactions. That time scale is the time it takes to go from one side of the proton to the other. It's the time it takes for strong interactions to kind of do anything at a distance scale of one small fraction of fermion. So all hadrons that can decay by the strong interactions to other hadrons are going to have lifetimes of this sort. Those are QCD constants. Obviously we're not going to observe those, except as resonances and others. Then there are others which, well, let's go to the proton and neutron here. here. Obviously those are stable or from point of view of collider, effectively stable. And in between we have others which decay by the electroweak interactions. And therefore, their lifetimes are delayed. 
And they have quite a broad range of lifetimes, in fact. Electroweak but prompt, what does that mean? Well, prompt means that the decay occurs after such a short distance that we do not observe any displacement for the decay. For example, pi zero has a lifetime of 10 to the minus 17 seconds. That's too short to observe anything. By the way, the distance scale, if, if these things aren't heavily boosted, three nanoseconds is a meter, right? So this is a tiny, 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 tiny fraction of that. So pi zero turns into two photons long before the pi zero gets anywhere outside of any, anywhere near the beam level. So a pi zero is just a pair of photons from the point of view experiment. By contrast, the pi plus and pi minus has a lifetime which naively is already 10 meters, but of course it also typically has energy which is larger than its mass by quite a bit. Typically these things have GV or more 10 GV, and so there's a boost factor on top of that. So these things are effectively stable. So things in green are things that are effectively stable, not just from our point of view, but from the point of view of an LHC detector. Okay, and you see what they are. Pions, K plus, K long, and then of course the proton and neutron. That's basically what we see in the detector. Well, we see a few more. We see ones that travel a centimeter or so. There's a couple of strange baryons, actually several strange baryons, and also the K short. These are particles that will travel and potentially decay in the interior of the detector. You have to be ready for that. They just decay to a couple of particles, or maybe three, so it's not that difficult to find, but anyway, you have to be aware of that. And finally, the most important is a, is a magical accident, which we'll discuss, which is that for charm and bond quarks, they travel sort of, whoops, I forgot to change that. That should be a micrometer. These should be a micron, um, not, not a millimeter. So please, in your head, this is a thousand times too big. So they travel a fraction of a centimeter, which is long enough that we can often measure. But not so long that they enter the detector and stay inside the beam most of the time, unless they really, really lose it. So there's magic in that, in, in that fact. Magic experimentally, and a little bit of magic experimentally, and theoretically too. Okay, so just to summarize that, here are the particles that we actually observe in the detector. And I've thrown in the leptons as well, you know it's electrons and also the photon. Here are ones that you might see decay in the detector, and ones that you'll see decay inside the beam pipe. You'll actually observe displaced decay much of the time for bottoms and for, for bottom and, and charm mesons and baryons. Of course, if a bottom part has enough of a boost, and the higher energy we go, simply by coming to 100 TeV, you get the next collider, more and more of the time these bottom parts are going to be actually passing through the beam pipe before they decay. It's going to be Distinct future that we'll have to discuss uh, when it comes to that in the distant future. And then here there are also lots and lots of particles that decay long before you observe it. Excited bottom down and, 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 and uh, charm mesons, uh, certain um, various mesons made out of light, light quarks and strange quarks. Um, and I also thrown in the tau, although we're starting to be able to see displaced towns too. In fact, this is maybe even too, too broadly stated. You can, you can find displaced taps in every case, uh, more and more often. And what's at the bottom is what I already told you yesterday, so let me not spend time on that. Let me just conclude with a remark about what's in a jet. What's in a jet is hadrons. What happens? You, you make in some way a bunch of hadrons. Some of those hadrons decay immediately, and then they decay down to ones which are longer lived, and some of those decay on the way out before you observe them, and then finally you start to see things enter the detector, and those are mostly pions, k-longs, k-pluses, protons, and neutrons. How many of them are there? Well, in a 45 GeV jet produced in a Z-boson decay, this is the typical scale. Notice this is a probability on a log scale. Most of the jets have between you know, 10 and 20 charged particles. Actually, sorry, divide by two. This is, sorry, my mistake. Divide, ignore, ignore this, this is just a, this is before correcting for some experiment. Divide by two. Most of them at 45 GV, most jets have, uh, this is a two jet event, so divide by two, a single jet has about 10 charged particles, which means it probably has another five or so neutral particles. And the rate is not growing very fast. You can't read this here, but basically a fit as you vary the energy of 
expected in the jet, the number of part charged particles you observe is going up like something like the log squared of the energy squared. So even at a TeV, the number isn't gigantic. It's, it's tens, 20, 30. And some of those have not start carry a lot of energy. So typically, if you're looking at a jet, you're looking at maybe 10 to 20, at the LHC, you're looking at 10 to 20 particles, most of which are in a sort of separate core, and a few of which drift out to the outside because they run through low momentum and they curve up the magnetic field. And that's sort of what we see in that plot. Okay, um, I think this is a good place to stop. I will continue next time with a few more facts about ECD and more about how to make measurements. Any questions before we leave? Yeah. I've heard that nowadays you can even see quarks. You've heard that they can see tracks of quarks? No. I've heard that they can see quarks. You don't see tracks of quarks. I did. You don't see tracks of quarks. Quarks are, oh, quarks are cloaked in a distance of 10 to the minus 15 meters. You can see tracks of mesons. You can see bottom quark mesons in some cases. But they can, but you're not seeing a quark. Okay, thank you. 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 Thank in the electron proton scattering, you can measure the particle distribution functions of the charge particles, so basically the up part, the down part, the anti up and anti down. You also use neutrino scattering and scattering off the deuterons, and finally, you have to infer the gluon particle distribution function from various other facts. So it's a bit of a complicated story, but in any good particle physics textbook, they will, they will give you probably some. I think, I think Pascal Schroeder does a pretty good job covering this. I don't remember if he says much about the gluons. In the end, it's a complicated process, but, but, and it involves experts who really know how to do this, working very hard with their postdocs and their students. So